at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Hallelujah. John chapter 5. Well, good morning, Hopewell. I hope y'all praying for Pastor. Pastor is away preaching this morning in Indianapolis this morning. But let's make sure that we keep him lifted up and give, pray to God will give him travel and grace back home. And that God will use him this morning. God. Hallelujah. John chapter 5. I'm going to read from the New Living. No, the NIV version. NIV version. Um, I, I hope y'all let me have a little fun today. Amen? Amen. Um, so we're going to begin, and it says, um, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which is, Amoretic is called Beth Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. I don't know how to pronounce that word, pray for me. Here, a number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Let me stop real quickly. I know that many people have different versions of the Bible. And I've noticed something in studying. Can you just turn it down? Just a pinch. Um, that if you notice that if you have anything other than the King James Version, you're going to notice that verse 4 is missing. In NIV, NLT, it's not a mistake in your Bible. Really what it was is back in the day when you remember the Old Testament was wrote, written in Hebrew, amen? amen? And so there were different transcribes. And so some of the original writing did not have verse 4. And then other people found it later. And King James is the one that highlighted that verse 4 and put it in there that talked about the angel came and trouble the water. And it wasn't that that was um, a mistake. I want you to know that most NLV version, NLT, NIV actually has a footnote that talks about this verse. It was left out because they didn't find it in the original writing. The cool part about that is it never takes away from the power of the story. Amen. And later on, by the time you get to verse 13, it talks about Jesus and the, and the man that was healed. Um, talked about that the angels, something stirred the water. So it, it never take away the purpose of the text. So don't let that get discourage you. And I wasn't going to say anything about that, but it bothered me when I was studying. I'm like, wait, what happened to verse 4? Is my Bible broke? Is the app broke? Did they misprint my Bible? But it was there. It was a footnote there. So if you notice, if you have an NLV, NLT, NIV, you're going to notice it slips from verse 3 to verse 5. Amen? Amen. All right, I did my part. Verse 5. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat." and walk. Let's pray. So Father, we now thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Father God, I did my best to study. I did my best to prepare. But God, you are the only teacher for the church. So God, I submit my body, my mind, my spirit, and my voice, God, to speak unto you, God, what you want me to say to your people. So God, we love you. We thank you for your word that God, you've given us instructions how to live on this earth. And so, God, allow us, God, to use your word to make us better. So, Father God, we pray right now that this word would exhort you. It would educate your children. It would encourage your people and empower us to make you famous. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say amen. amen. And before you take your seat, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. the preacher told me to tell you, to get off your back. Off and, do and do something. Now look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor get off your neck and, and do something. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of y'all believe that 2017 is going to be your year? Okay. I'm not, you know, sometimes, you know, this is that time of year, everybody come in and say, oh yeah, this is my year, you know, our thing here, a lot of times is the, Something big is about to happen, amen? amen? 
But how many of y'all know that 2017 could be the best year of your life? Amen. Okay. So it's only 10 of y'all believe Amen. that 2017 could be the best years of your life. My job, my responsibility with this text today is that everybody in this room who is willing will walk away with the understanding that this could be the best year of your life. Amen. So I don't know, many of you hear the stories, but you, until you live with her, you, until you live with her, you don't know um, what I mean. I'm honored to be the parent of an amazing young lady by the name of Kristen Hood. And you know, yeah. God has blessed me with two daughters. One of my daughters keep me on my knees and the other one keep me on my toes. <laughs> and the one that keep me on my toes, um, one day, I was gonna say it's about four years ago, walked up to me, it was in November, I think it was around November 14th in 2012. And she walked up to me and she said, Daddy, what are you doing? And I said, well, baby, I'm doing some work. And she's like, oh, was you supposed to do that at work? And I was like, well, yeah, but I'm just trying to finish it so I can be ahead of time. So you were procrastinating. And I said, excuse me? And she said, I said, what does that mean? She was like, that's when you put off something that you were supposed to do then and did it later. And I was like, yeah. She was like, well, daddy, you know only use words that I know the meaning of and then just walked off. <laughs> and so I was sitting there like, should I punish her? Should I say something smart? I'm the adult in the room. I thought I should have to say something to her. But then I realized that she was right, that I had procrastinated. Yeah. That it was some things that I should have done at work that I didn't do. And what it was is I was taking away daddy time. Oh, wow. And so she quickly checked me and I make it my business that if I don't do all my work stuff at home, at work, I'm not doing it at home because I don't want to deal with the wrath of Christian. <laughs> if y'all pray for me, I promise you I'll get better, all right? Um, Here's what I want to say to you. So we talked about, Pastor Swims talked about last year, that not another year, right? We said in 2017, we're not going to do the same thing. We're not going to go through the motion. And so Pastor talked about we have to focus, right? He said we got to work out our plan. We got to make it up in our mind. What are those two or three things that we're going to do and we're going to do well? And here's what I've come to find out, that a lot of us, um, do write out the plan. How many of us wrote out the plan? Don't forget you in church. Don't, don't, don't lie. Ray, raise your hand if you wrote out your plan so far. Okay. All right. So we only got three or four people serious about 2017. The Bible is clear that we need to write the vision and make it plain so that when we see it, we can run for it. It gives us an opportunity to press toward a mark, right? Here comes the other part. But for some of us, and I've been writing out my plan for 2017, um, but it really, I come to realize that Although once I write it, I got to do something. It's not just going to come easy. Um, I talk about I want a new job this year. Um, I got to update my resume. I got to look for jobs. I got to fill out applications. I got to submit my information. I got to be ready to answer the question. The simple question is, why do you think you qualify for this job? What's, what's your leadership style? Um, why are you leaving your old place of work? What's about that place? We have to get to a place that we have to do something. Yeah. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, says it like this. Anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it is sin. Watch it. So if you know you're supposed to be doing something and you're not doing it, you're sinning. Oh, my God. Don't get mad at me. That's what the Bible say. But it's okay because watch this. Once you knew better, know better, you have to do better. And so if we're going to get better, we have to ask ourselves, what are we postponing? What are we afraid of? Here's, I'm going to give you five quick things that we're going to move forward that tells us reasons why we procrastinate. In James chapter 1, verse 8, you will find it says, a double-minded man, double man is unstable in all he does. Have you ever sent a waiter, sent a waiter in a restaurant back to the back because you wasn't ready to order yet? I know I've done it a couple of times, especially when you go out to dinner with your friends and the waiter, like, you ready? It's like, no, I need another five minutes. Another five minutes. And the waiter is looking at you like, come on, I got other tables to do. I need a good tip, so I need to make sure that I'm serving you quickly and you're pushing me back. Um, how, what are some of the ways that we are indecisive? Um, some of the ways is because we, we postpone when we're buying a car, you know. We, we want to make sure it's the right deal. We, um, we, we, when we get ready to choose college, I did work with college students all the time. 
A lot of times you stu you, you're talking to students and they're trying to figure out where they want to go. They're indecisive because they can't make up their mind. Some people are indecisive when it comes to getting married. Okay, um, this is the one that bothers me. When we go to the store and we go shopping and we got 10 things on the list and we're in Walmart for two hours, I don't understand that. I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. Uh, we knew what we were coming to get. Don't judge me. My daughter say, Daddy, I go to the store with you. We get out of here quick. When I go with Mama, it be all day. What's the difference? I said, baby, I don't know. Ask Mama. Because I ain't the only one going to deal with her at the Christmas. Hey, man. Another reason why we procrastinate is perfectionism. Um, Ecclesiastics 11.4 says it this way. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. If you're waiting on things to get perfect, you're going to wait a long time. You don't have the time nor the money to wait, things, make things, wait for things to happen. So a lot of times we think about what we want to do. We say, oh God, I want to do this. Well, every condition is going to be perfect. If it was that easy, you would have already been right. there. Right. Next one is fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says it like this. The fear of a man is a trap. Have you been postponing going to the dentist? To later find out that you cause more damage in your mouth if you would have went ahead of time? Yeah. Yeah. Or are you needing surgery and you're going to wait till your hip completely fall off before you go get the hip surgery? I said it fall off. I said it. I'm talking about when you can't get out the bed, you crying, rolling. There are people that do that. I know. Uh, sharing your faith at work. Why are you afraid to talk about God that you serve? They're already judging you. They know you go to church, but they don't want to know why you're smoking that cigarette outside the building, cussing folks out, talking about the boss just like everybody else. I didn't mean to say that. Anger is another reason. Proverbs 18.9 says that a lazy person is as bad as someone who is destructive. Procrastination is a way to get back at people we don't like. We delay. Kids are great at procrastination. You ask them to clean up their room. And they go up there and they take them two hours to get it done because they're resisting your control. Mm, yeah. Procrastination is a passive resistance. Mm, yeah. I don't want to do it because I don't like you telling me to do what I have to do. Right. Anger causes us to put things off. You know, one of the newest phrases that I have to watch, Kristen tell Kasia on a regular basis, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> hmm? How many of us feel that way? That you are not the boss of me. Here's the last one. Um, laziness. Um, Proverbs 13, 4 says, Lazy people want much but get little while the diligent are prospering. One of the most popular words in America is easy. It's easy. If it was hard, we don't like it. Can you imagine the number one seller in the world be called the 10 difficult steps to change your life? Would you buy a book that says 15 difficult ways to get in shape? <laughs> the task will always be hard when you refuse to do the work to make it easy. I want you to know today that God blesses perseverance, not easy. Are you telling me that God expects me to do something? Absolutely, I am. Let me give you some word to back it up. Turn to James chapter 2 if you have your Bibles. We're going to do a little work. If you have your pen and paper, write it down. I'm sure this is something you'll be able to go back and look at later. Amen? Amen. James chapter 2, and we're going to look at starting at verse number 14. And listen to this. It says, um, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, by faith itself is not enough unless it produces good deeds. It is deed and useless. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you, even the demons believe this, 
and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor, Abraham, was shown to be right with God by his actions? And when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And it so happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God, and God counted him righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. You see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Here's what I want you to see real quickly. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is useless. What use is it for man to say he has faith without no words? Let me clear this up. So I am not talking about salvation. You cannot get saved by your works. We are saved by grace. Oh, what do I mean by that? Okay. I did nothing to get saved other than to acknowledge the fact that I was a sinner. It was all the gift of Christ, the reason why I'm saved. So I'm saved by grace. Because I'm saved by grace, I have to have the faith that I'm supposed to do something. What do I do? The Bible teaches us that we must follow his commandments. We must live by his rules. We must share the gospel with others. And the key thing that we're talking about today is we have to accept his promises. So what are you planning to do this year is the focus of this message, right? What are you doing? So pastor started it. Let's get some application. So for you, many of you that says that I want a stronger prayer life, let's talk about that. How do you build a stronger prayer life? Here's where it starts. You're not going to be able to pray like my wife and pray for one hour straight, nonstop, without taking a breath. You're not going to be doing able to do that right out the gate. You have to build your prayer life. So for some of you, you might take you to do this. Agree to pray for three minutes two times a day. In the morning, I'm going to dedicate and commit myself to praying for three minutes two times a day. One in the morning, one at night. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some of you who have been saved long enough, you can go longer than three minutes. Push yourself. If you know you can pray for five minutes, then challenge yourself to pray for ten. Does that make sense? Okay. For some of you, it's like, well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. Here's one of the things that I've done that helped me. I started. Okay. I started. <laughs> I started by coming to prayer service, even though I didn't know how to pray. Mm -hmm. I needed to be in the environment to hear other people praying, so that God can begin to minister to me and help me develop my prayer life. Amen. One of the other things I used to do would come to prayer while they're praying. I would open up my Bible. I would open up the Book of Psalms, and I would read those because a lot of those are not only poems. But they're prayers. So if I want to be growing my prayer life, I have to put myself in an environment where I can grow in that area. I have to challenge myself. I know I have this conversation sometimes. Or oh, this one. So I'm trying something new with my devotion time, my prayer life, what I want to do this year. And I've caught myself being good for the first four days. The fifth day, I, time got away from me. I didn't. And I thought about it. I'm like, ah, oh, I forgot to pray. Okay, well, I'll just pray double time tomorrow to make up for it. But then my spirit was like, no, you need to force yourself to stop what you're doing to go pray. And so I'm not saying that for accolades. I'm telling you that it's a constant battle to stop you from doing what you're supposed to do. And so you have to push yourself to do it even though you don't want to. There was nothing that important that I was getting ready to do that I couldn't stop and do what I said I was going to do from the very beginning. So I refused to allow myself to procrastinate doing something that I needed to do. Does that kind of make sense? Amen. So we talk about, um, we want to grow closer to God. What are you doing to grow closer? You know, a lot of us, we come here week in, week out. I'm going to take, throw my disclaimer, I am not judging no one. I'm just sharing what God shared with me to give with you this morning. Amen. There are so many of us who come to church and we just feel like because I come in the door, I've done my part. That's not enough. You are, our works by faith is a response that God has done something great for me. God said when he went and got his disciples, he said, I'm going to make you fishermen of men. Amen. 
So I'm going to ask the question. I told you no judge zone. When was the last time you invited one person to church? In the whole year. So I want to grow closer with God. I'm going to close, grow closer by learning, getting closer to you. But I'm also going to introduce somebody else to Christ. As your word told me to. He that wins a soul is wise, is what the word of God says. So if we want to grow, we got to talk about it. Okay, um, you're going to start seeing me in Sunday school more frequently. I'm going to be honest with you. I love Sunday school. I grew up in it. My schedules got kind of crazy, but I've kind of told myself. And I even had this conversation with Pastor. Pastor, I apologize because I'm not being a good leader. I'm in Bible study, but God, I need to be in the presence of teaching whenever I can. I don't care how spiritual I think I am. There's always room for me to grow. Amen. Sunday school is not here for the purpose of just saying we got another service. Amen. It's for us to grow. Amen. And so Chester, telling you right now, I'm standing before you, that I'm going to make it my business. If I don't do it every single Sunday, at least once a month, I know I'm going to be in Sunday school. Amen. I know that. I know I'm going to do it because I need to come and learn. I ain't come to, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about coming to come to teach. I'm coming to learn. People take time out of their week to study, to prepare for Sunday school so we can grow. Amen. And we miss that opportunity. Again, I'm not hitting nobody upside the head. I'm just telling you what God told me. For others, y'all come to Sunday school and might not come to Bible study. So on Sunday morning, we get 30 to 45 minutes to cram a sermon together, put something together to present to you, and we can't really go into detail because if I just go into real detail, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy and ask me, am I done yet? So in Sunday school, it gives us an opportunity to present the word in a way that if you have questions, you can get your questions answered, right? right. On Thursday night, Bible study, pastor can preach for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then normally at the end of it, he said, what questions do you have about what we talked about? So we can begin to sharpen one another. So if we're talking about in 2017, we want to get better, right? Not another year. We have to do some things different. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. For some of you, um, it's about weight loss. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm not where I need to be. I've been able to lose 220 pounds over the last five years. I'm grateful for that. Thank God. Hallelujah. Um, I got a, I'm on a goal now. I got to lose another 125 so I can be healthy. I um, had a conversation with my doctor. My doctor told me, hey, we got to do something. I said, I'm with you. Let's go. Here's what I want to do. For those who are challenging, have a challenge in losing weight, I want to throw some tips to you that work for me well. Um, I will tell you what I did to this, go through this process. Weight just started falling off. I'm not telling you I was in the gym every day. I wasn't. Matter of fact, I was in the rec center one day a week, and I was in the pool for about two and a half hours, and it just fell off. Here's what I learned. One of the biggest problems that I had with losing weight was I was eating my meal, I was eating one big meal a day and just nibbling on little small stuff all throughout the week. I mean all throughout the day. Here's what I learned. My metabolism doesn't work right unless I eat multiple times a day. When you eat one time and you're craving as you're hungry and you feel like you're not going to eat, what happens is your body feels like it's going into starvation mode so it has to store fat. So one of the things I had to do, I had to start eating more frequently. I had to eat six times a day versus one time a day. What happens also is portion size. I'm a big guy. Y'all know I can eat, right? I had to get to a point where I took a normal plate and divided it in three. I still ate my whole plate, but I didn't eat it in one set. So in other words, if I had this one big plate, instead of eating it all in one setting, I eat a third of it, put it up, go back and eat another third. And guess what? I'm okay with that. I can do that. My body liked it. But again, a lot of because my day was so busy, I was only eating my plate at dinner time. So my body has been starving all throughout the morning. So I had to get to a point to realize that breakfast is one of the most important meals of the day. You have to eat more frequently. I know that don't sound right, but the portion sizes have to drop. Drinking water. Oh my God, I have to drink water. I've been trying all week getting back to drinking a gallon of water a day. That's really about maybe 16 cups of water. I can do it. You can too. Water is one of your best friends. Your body needs it. Here's what I've done. Anytime my body was hungry, I fed it. But I didn't eat 
to get full at eight to kill the hunger pain. When we get to a point where we can eat to kill the hunger pain and we're eating more frequently, your body begins to burn more fat and you're going to begin to lose weight. That's without doing one drop of exercise. If you challenge yourself to even just work out two times a week, I promise you within six months you're going to see a life change. Now, you do have to give up some of your favorites. Did I say that out loud? I had to give up one of mine. Peach Cobbler was my favorite. And Mama Algie loved me well. She used to make me a parent for the house. I haven't had real Peach Cobbler in about maybe three years. I had to give up my baby. <laughs> I did. But you know what? I feel better. I feel better. I feel healthier. Um, I used to cringe walking from my parking lot to my building. It used to hurt me because I'd be out of breath halfway there. And I realized I had to do something different. Here's what happened to me. I started doing these healthy things for a little while. And I was a really good boy. I really was. I was doing it well. i never forget. It was one day I said, I'm going to go to Applebee's. And I said, I'm going to all best off today. I've been good. I'm eating good. Eating good. They brought me a steak. Brought me some mashed potatoes. Brought me some broccoli. Brought me a sweet tea mixed with lemonade. I was good to go. And I sat there. Ate a piece of my steak, ate a spoonful of mashed potatoes, three pieces of broccoli, and my body said I was full. And I said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I'm going to eat all of this today. Here's the reality of it. I immediately, my mind went to say, this is what I've been praying for. This is what I was hoping for, that I don't always have to eat these big meals. And I immediately said, you can box this, I'm good. And I promise you, I've never regretted it. Now, I've got some unhealthy habits lately. I'm building back up to where I need to go. But I want to tell you that for those who want to lose it, come talk to me. I will share it with you. I promise you it'll work if you are committed to it. For some of you, it might be um, business. You want to start your own business. Um, here it is, you have to act like you, 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 you really finna open a business. You need to set office hours. You need to set up, say, these two hours I'm dedicating every week to opening my business. You need to come up with a business name. You need to register your business if you're for real about it. You can register with the state, register with the feds, register with the county. I did, my business is up and going, and it ain't that expensive. You get a federal ID number for your business for free with the IRS. They want your money. They want to tax you later, so it's free. Mm -hmm. To register your business with the county, it costs $35. Then you have to buy an article in the newspaper for it to run for so many weeks to make sure that there's no other business in this area that has that name. After that, you're good to go. They give you a license and everything. I got mine that's just not hanging on the wall. If you want to start a business, it's not hard. I'm going to be honest with you. That's part of my business. Shameless plug. One of my things is I help businesses get started. I you know, help bring your idea to life. If you want to do it, come talk to me. We, let's talk about ordering business cards. Get it going. Because I'm going to be honest with you, you've got to get some traction to get it going. It's not hard. If this is really what you want to do, you've got to find your niche. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, for some of y'all, you want to. it might be something simple. Like you want to stop being late for work. That's your plan this year. <laughs> Amen. I think that's a good plan if you want to keep your job. Uh, so one of the ways you got to do this, you got to stop being on social media at night. You need to learn to go to bed. You need to stop trying to catch up on the shows that you missed. It's on DVR. You can do it later. I'm being practical, but I'm being real. Your bosses are looking at you if you're late. We are, I'm, my fact, my boss wants, I've had several jobs where my bosses walk up, such and such been late, I need you to track every moment they late. And they don't say nothing, they let you hang yourself. If you know that's you, you need to get your act together. You need to start going to bed. Matter of fact, I thank God for iPhone, they got a new thing called rest. I don't know if you know this. It's an alarm that tells me it's time for me to go to bed so I can get my seven and a half hours, and then it wakes me up in seven and a half hours. It, I'm not joking. If you got an iPhone, check it out. It'll bless your life. <laughs> it was about 10.45. And beep, 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 you need to go to bed in 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not tired yet. Go to sleep. 
But if I want to start getting all the rest that I need so I can be on time, I can. Um, so let me tell y'all something. So I'm not going to stand here today and tell you that um, you need to get off your mat and do something, and I'm not going to do it. And so I'm publicly announcing it today um, that um, I am now getting ready to get off my bed, off my bed, off my mat today, and I'm building a men's ministry for Hopewell. Uh, I've got permission and the blessing from Pastor to get it going in 2017. Some people ask why, why now? Um, too many of our marriages are falling apart. There are too many seasoned married men in this room that can help encourage our young married husbands and our soon-to-be married men to prepare them for life. We need a men's ministry so we can impact the lives of the young men in this church so that they don't become hashtags, so they don't become fathers before their time, before they become members of the Department of Corrections. We need a men's ministry to make sure that our women and children are safe yes. so that while we're in this building and this community, we know that they are taken care of. Amen. We need a men's ministry to help carry the weight so we don't worry, so we don't burn out the men that are already serving in this church. Amen. It's important that we do this. And the reason why it's important to do this is because I'm not at no form or fashion negating any of the hard work of the women that are in this church that serve and do what they're supposed to do. Amen. But they're carrying too much weight that is not their responsibility. Amen. As men, we have to step up and do our part. Amen. It's oh, one thing to say it across this pulpit, but it's another thing to stand up and do what we're supposed to do. Um, how, what do you mean? I'm going to be honest with you. There are men in this audience that are more than able to drive our church van. We're going to burn out the one that we have. That is so unfair. We have a prayer team. There, there are no men involved. We have to change that. Amen. Men, we don't know how to pray. We don't believe that God will hear us. We have to do something different. Um, I, have, I love Dr. Ba uh, Brother Baker. Brother Baker is amazing. He's committed to what he does. But he don't get to serve, get to enjoy worship. Because he's in the parking lot every single Sunday. Yes, he gets to go online and watch it and listen to it, but he don't get to come in and enjoy it because he's always serving. Yeah. We have to do something about that. Yeah. And so I'm telling you today that um, if we're going to do better, if we're going to make sure that the same thing don't happen in 2016, um, we're going to have to do something different in 2017. Right. I'm going to give you four things, and then I'm going to leave you alone today based off of the text that I gave John chapter 5. If you go back to John chapter 5, I want to highlight four things that that man did. And then uh, we're going to move forward and let you go for the day. Amen? Amen? Here's the first thing. If you're going to do something, first you have to identify what you want to do. That man knew that he needed to get in that pool. That man knew that the only way that he was going to get healed, he had to do something different. There are those, if given an opportunity for healing, will actually choose to remain sick. There, in other words, there we spend so much time saying this is what we want to do. When was the last? I do. I say it that way. Thank you, Holy Ghost. If you think about it for a moment, if you think about what your goals are in every year, what are some of those things you kept saying? I'm gonna do that this year. That you said last year. That you said the year before. The year before, the year before, the year before. When do you get to a place and realize, do you really want to do that? Or does it just sound good? Anything that you want to do, you put your mind to it. Anything you want to do, you put your mind to it. Second thing that I want you to know, you have to quit blaming others for your problems or your progress. Is no, nobody else stopping you from being where you need to go but you? Amen. Nobody else but you. Third, well, no, let's go there for a second. Um, the man said this, he was complaining. Every time the bubbles up, no one was here to help him get in the pool. Right. The stronger ones always get, always got to the water first. The one who needs help can't get who can't get in. It has been that way for 30 years. 
Have you been blaming people for your problems since the beginning of time? Watch this here. We've been blaming the Bible. You see, you see that all the time. Listen, in, in the Garden of Eden, when, when Adam, Adam, let's think about Adam for a moment, right? Adam, Adam ate off the apple. God said, Adam, where are you? What's going on? What have you done? He said, this woman that you gave me is the reason why I did it, right? Let's talk about Moses. Moses asked his brother Aaron why he let the Israelites worship a golden cow. Aaron said, well, you were gone and the people made me do it. I didn't really do anything. I just threw their jury into the fire of pool. And poof, out came a golden calf. So blame them. Blame the fire. The fire did it. But don't blame me. Students do it all the time when they say, I would do better in school, but my teacher doesn't like me. I would go further in life, but you don't understand how I was raised. We have a hard time saying these words. I was wrong. I'm actually responsible. We have to get to a point where we stop blaming others. Amen. The third thing is we have to be willing to be stretched. Jesus motivated the lame man to stretch himself. Jesus often told people that in order to be healed, they must do something. He said to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. And he, when he did that, he was healed. Yes. Um, Jesus put dirt on the eyes of the blind man and said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he did, suddenly he could see. Jesus said this to this man, pick up your mat and walk. We have stretched ourselves when we are willing to do something. Here it is, you have to be committed to do what you agreed to do this year. If you start off in January saying, I'm going to do this, you need to be that same committed in March. You got to be that same committed in August. You got to be that same committed in December until it's all said and done. Amen. So last week, Pastor told us that if we want to be focused in 27 today, in 2017, um, that we have to. If you want to do something different, you have to remain focused. Today, I'm telling you, you cannot allow yourself to procrastinate. Um, here's the verse that I want to share with you. It says, Philippians 4, 8 and 9, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learn and receive from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Here it is. If I was a Baptist preacher that knew how to hoop, this is when the preacher would try to go to the cross. This is when the preacher would say over 2,000 years ago, right? It would talk about that Jesus did the same thing that I'm sharing with you. He sat in heaven beside his father and said that, God, I need to do something different. God, I need to go to earth because they have lost their connection with you. God, I'm no longer going to blame and hold a cow or some doves responsible to pay for their sins. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go do something for them. Then Jesus said, you know what? When I get to earth, they're going to beat me and God, they're going to stretch me. And I'm okay with that because if this is your will, then that's what I'm going to do. And God, I'm going to be that committed that even while they were yet sinners, I'm going to die for them and I'm going to be there for them. And I'm going to be their God. And there is nothing they can do that will ever separate me from your love. And so because of that, I'm going to get off of my throne and I'm going to go to earth and I'm going to do something for them. And in response, once I saved them and told them different, I'm expecting them to do something different. And I say that to you today, Hope Well. I hope that in 2017 we get up to a place that we realize that we have to get up off our mat and that we have to do something. If you don't mind, if you, everyone that can, please stand. Hallelujah. I'm going to say this to y'all. And I think it's appropriate now. Um, I stretch myself every time I stand up behind this podium. Because there are some times that I try to, <laughs> that my flesh and the enemy tries to speak to me and tell me that this is not what God has called me to do. And I know this is what he calls me to do because there are nights I can't even sleep. Because this is all he does is talk. I was in good shape um, all week. 
I promise you, I woke up this morning feeling a little draggy. And the moment I got out the shower and got dressed, my stomach started squeezing. I started feeling a feeling like, oh my God, what is this? All week long, God, I ain't had to worry about this. Why? It's not even a sense of nervousness. It's almost like, don't do it. Because a lot of times I deal with some of the, um, is it confidence? Is the word? That if this is what God told me to say, if this is what God told me to do, because at the end of the day, I know I'm going to have to get account for everything that comes across my lips. And never have God ever, and I don't think he ever will, would ever allow me to stand in this place and not say what he said. And this word might not be for everybody. I know that there are some preachers that are amazing that will stand here, will hoop this message, yell and scream it, and make everybody jump up and high five. I will be honest with you, I preach to one audience, and that's the audience of one, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And as long as I say what he told me to say, I can rest at night knowing that I said what he told me to say. Yes. So, fellas, I'm telling you first, that was not no joke. That's not a part, just a part of something that sounds good in my sermon. We are developing a men's ministry. We need to get together. Fellas, we need to talk. When I when you get the message, when Pastor put it out, we need to come in the room and we need to talk about what y'all want to talk about, what y'all want to deal with. But we gotta do better. We gotta do better. We we gotta do better. We gotta do better. We will do better. And at this moment, there might be somebody in this room that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And at this opportunity today.